An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. Now, the lightsaber was the very first sound that I ever manufactured for Star Wars. At the time I was uh, just leaving USC Film School, I was a projectionist at the school. I had a part-time job. And in the projection booth were these old 35-millimeter theater projectors, which, when they were just turned on and sat idle, they had a very interesting humming sound. It was part of the interlock motors in the projectors. And I used to be in the booth working, and I would uh, enjoy that sound. It was a nice musical kind of hum. And when I saw the pictures of the lightsaber and the artwork for the film, I thought, wow, I think that hum of that projector motor is just the right thing. So I went and recorded the hum and held on to it as the basis for the lightsabers. As I thought about it some more, I felt that the hum was not quite dangerous enough sounding. It needed some other element. And the other element came about by accident. I had a microphone cable that was broken partially. And as I was carrying my tape recorder across my apartment one day and I went near the television set, the microphone picked up the buzz from the television picture tube, just a direct electronic interference. And I took the buzz and combined it with the projector hum, and the two sounds together became the basis for the laser sword. To produce the sound of the moving lightsabers, I took the steady recording of the hum and buzz and played it over a speaker in a room, and then re-recorded that sound with another microphone. And I could take that microphone and wave it around in the air, and it would produce what's called a Doppler effect. That is, a pitch shift because the sound is moving relative to the microphone. And by doing that, I was able to take the steady sound of the lightsaber and give it a sense of movement, of coming to and fro or back and forth. Uh, and if you did it very quickly in front of the speaker, it would make the sound seem like it was whizzing towards someone in a fight. So um, it, wasn't, it was a matter of not only creating the sound, but also creating a movement of the sound, which uh, gave the lightsabers a basis for their their noise and, you know, their credibility. The hits of the lightsabers were a combination of several different sources, principally a carbon arc being ignited. The old motion picture projectors and large bright lamps at the old studios, uh, the actual um, light was produced by burning two carbon rods, running electricity through them, and then a spark would jump between them and they'd actually burn. And when you start up one of these carbon arcs, there's a jump of sparks from one rod to another, and it makes a wonderful squeaking sound, and you can play around with it, you get a spark and a squeaking at the same time. In addition, there were sounds of dry ice and metal combined. If you take a piece of metal and place it against a piece of dry ice, you get a squeaky sound as the dry ice evaporates. And taking the dry ice sounds as well as the carbon arc sounds and combining them together made up the sounds of the lightsaber hits. The voice of R2-D2 turned out to be the most prolonged and difficult sound to develop. That took a long time. That was the hardest task I had on Star Wars. You know, the first sound I actually ever made for it was a lightsaber. I came up with that basically in three or four days. I just had an idea for it right away. But R2-D2 took, oh, it was about a year of work of, of collecting, wow. experimenting, trying to get something. Because it, it involved a performance, and it also had no precedent. There hadn't been a film before which had a main character that didn't speak English and didn't have a moving mouth. Just you reconsider playing that message for him. No, I don't think he likes you at all. No, I don't like you either. R2 was described in the script as beeping and buzzing and whistling. The script did not prescribe the specific lines of dialogue that he, that he had but merely said that R2 responded or R2 beeped or something of that sort. And it was left up to me to try to come up with possibilities for George Lucas to listen to. George at one point thought that perhaps even recording babies before they could talk, but the sounds that babies make cooing and a sighing and little vocalizations they make as they learn to talk might be the key to R2's voice. And it was definitely the right direction to go because R2 is, well, kind of an ornery child. 
he's smart, but he's also has a certain innocence about him. He can be insubordinate, uh, but overall he's lovable. And as the film was being developed and being cut in the editing room, I would try out different R2 voices and then get uh, an assessment from George as to what he thought. And time and time again, he wasn't satisfied with what I was doing and that uh, we really needed the voice to have more character to it. One day when uh, George and I were discussing the voice, and we both found ourselves imitating, making little funny noises as we kind of describe what R2 might be like. And it uh, dawned on us that, well, maybe the very noises that we were making, the little cute vocalizations that we were using as kind of a means of symbolically manufacturing R2's voice, well, maybe that would lead us in the right direction. I ended up doing vocalizations at the same time I play a keyboard on an old ARP synthesizer. And I learned to sort of whistle and beep along with what I was playing on the keyboard. Ah. And through a lot of practice, I would get something that sounded expressive. And I could say, oh, though, that's R2 saying, come this way, or he's, he's making a rude remark to 3PO or something. Once I combined my voice with the synthesizer, I would often take the sounds of R2 out into the real world and play them over a speaker in a room, in a hallway, in a bathroom, and re-record the lines such that they actually were recorded in, not in a studio, they actually had the quality of being in a real place. And that was key to getting a lot of the, the sounds to blend in and seem natural as if they were really done on the set. The key being to process what we call worldizing the voices, that is taking the sounds and playing them back and re-recording them in real places where you get a sense of the reflections of sound in the environment. A lot of the attempts at doing R2-D2's voice uh, the outtake, so to speak, ended up being the voices of other robots in the film. The binocular robot. The various other R2 units on board the sand crawler. So most of the material that I generated got used somewhere in the film. It just became uh, robots of, of less importance. <laughs> No, it's all right, but I think we better go. What's wrong with them now? There are several creatures approaching from the southeast. What is Anthony Daniels was not initially considered to be the final voice of C-3PO. Originally, it was going to be Stan Freeberg. We did some tracks with, with him, and he was good. George wanted this kind of, as he described it, used car salesman feel to 3PO originally. They told me, well, John and Yoko were a little nervous because they, you're a satirist. They thought you would have at them or something, you know, which is just pure bull, you know, anyhow. So I'm sitting out in the audience now, and John and Yoko come out, you know, and the first thing he says is, where's Freeberg? You know? Yeah. He thought I was going to be there. But once uh, the film began being put together in the editing room and the tracks of Tony Daniels were there as reference, everybody eventually just fell in love with them. I think that's really where my relationship, or 3PO's relationship with Artu really started, because he was such a menace <laughs> that I used to get across with him anyway. And then, you know, throughout the films now, there's always this relationship where I'm always kicking him for being stupid. And although it wasn't the original intention that 3PO would have a British accent, the fact that Tony was so good in the part and his body language was so coordinated with his vocal talents that it really didn't seem to make sense to try to develop another voice and impose it onto the 3PO character. It was just something that came about so successfully through the talents of Tony Daniels. Yeah. I'm quite sure you'll be very pleased with that one, sir. He really is in first-class condition. I've worked with him before. So eventually Tony was brought into the studio and all of his lines recorded properly. Those lines done on the set were har hardly audible because of the, you know, the face mask that's on him made it hard to, to pick his sound up clearly. And then the costume itself made a tremendous amount of noise, the plastic scraping and crackling as he talked. And none of the tracks of 3PO done, done on the set were usable. In fact, the sound of 3PO's costume was so noisy that it often required the replacement of dialogue by other actors uh, in the scene because his 
suit made so much noise. Between R2 and 3PO, the R2 made a lot of noise and clunking around, and 3PO's costume pretty much required us to loop a lot of the other actors along the way. I was listening to a lot of different African languages, and Zulu came up in a recording, and uh, in listening to it, I thought that this might be a good basis for the Jawa language to, for a start. The Jawa voices and their development became the prototype for how we would develop languages and alien voices for those characters in the films that were not electronic, but they spoke an actual organic tongue. I listened to a lot of language tapes from around the world. Out of that came uh, samples of languages, real languages, which sounded very exotic and they weren't recognizable as something familiar. But like any real language, they come with their unique historic and uh, you know cultural details. They, they're usually developed over a long period of time. The laser guns were developed on the basis of one particular sound. I was hiking in Pennsylvania on a vacation during the early stages of the production of uh, Star Wars. And I was hiking over a, a mountaintop in the Pocono Mountains and went beneath a radio tower which had large guy wires coming down to anchor it. And my pack caught on one of these guy wires and as I went by it made a twanging sound, an unusual sound. And I immediately said to myself, well, that's a laser gun. It had an otherworldly sound to it. And when I returned to California, I went around Southern California in the region of Los Angeles, banging on the guy wires of different radio towers to come up with just the right sound. I finally found the right radio tower out in the Mojave Desert, near Palmdale, California. There was a small radio station out there which had a sort of broken down tower next to its little transmitting station. They had one particular guy wire which was uh, did not have the wind dampeners on it. Sometimes they have these large um, styrofoam balls on the wires which prevent them from vibrating. They're actually there to reduce the, the drag of the wind on the wires. And I found this one particular cable on that tower and uh, banged it with different pieces of metal. And, uh, and out of that came the, the sound which was used as the, the basic sound for all the laser guns. One of the very few sound effects recorded during the location shooting was the mules, which were used to backpack the camera gear into the location in Tunisia. And I think it was Gary Kurtz, maybe George Lucas, that heard the braying of these mules and had the sound man go out and record them in the rocks. And they sent them back to me. They didn't really know what they were going to be used for, but it seemed to me that they were Tuscan Raiders. And so the basis for the Tuscan Raiders were really mules, which they were cut up a bit and changed in speed. And then eventually I did some more animals back here in the United States. I even recorded a person who could imitate a mule. And uh, by taking those various recordings, we were able to, able to come up with several different Tuscan Raider voices. <laughs> Be cautious. I went all over the place to record things. One of the places I went was to a company which tests jet engines inside before they're put on a full-size aircraft. And I went into their test chambers and put some microphones up 
And of course, then you don't stay in the test chamber because they, they run the engines up to full speed in a tiny room and the sound would probably kill you if you stayed in there. But uh, I had a microphone in there wrapped in towels to kind of muffle the sound just a little bit. But out of that recording uh, came the sound of reverse thrusters, which is the, the sound of a jet engine when an airplane commercial jet lands and it hits the runway. They, it actually reverses the airflow in the engines uh, to slow the plane down. And that reverse thrusting, whining sound that the engine makes is what was used for the pass-bys of Luke's land speeder. Look, at there's a droid on the scanner, dead ahead. Might be our little R2 unit. Hit the accelerator. One day, maybe I was bored, I took um, my microphone and I put it inside the pipe that's part of the... Uh, suction device on a vacuum cleaner and I held it out the window and I just pointed it at the Los Angeles freeway and the roar of the freeway as it went through this metal pipe and then to the microphone had a funny kind of phasing or slight echoing to it and that became the sound of the force field of the land speeder as it hovers in space it became the basis actually for all the kind of levitation force fields which are used in many Star Wars speeders and other, uh, and other vehicles. The cantina really represents a sort of variety pack of all the different things I tried in the development of voices or robots for the film. It required so many different characters and voices, and there were unique individuals and aliens all throughout the place. And so out of the recordings I had been making of animals and of exotic foreign languages, and the various processing I was doing. Some of the sounds were dogs growling. There were the sounds of bats squeaking. There was a variety of different African languages. I recorded a number of different foreign students in conversation that could speak Swahili or Haya. I produced some electronic sounds for little voices. And we also needed just the general what's called walla, that is the background babble of voices throughout the canteen and going steady. And I actually made that by getting a group of the editors together on the film. And we all got into a room together and we all got balloons full of helium. And everybody inhaled a good dose of helium. And now helium makes your voice go up in pitch. And of course, it does make people laugh a little bit because it sounds funny. And if you had a variety of both male and female voices all on helium at the same time, it produced an interesting kind of babbling sound, which was used for a lot of the background voices in the cantina. Yes, Greedo. As a matter of fact, I was just going to see your boss. Tell Jabba that I've got his money. Song Pichale. Maratam Titah Makichisa. Jabba wa ninchikoh pamushani kaitani wanyaruska. The voice of Greedo was the first time we ever really heard Hatiz spoken in Star Wars. And later, of course, Hatiz would become a prominent language throughout the whole series. Hatiz came about because in my search for interesting real languages, I came across a language called Quechuan, which was related to the Incan Indians of Peru. 
and it was a language that still did exist in remote parts of South America. And I brought into the picture a man named Larry Ward, and Larry was a linguist, and he was very good at hearing a foreign language and then imitating it, even even though he didn't know how to speak it. He was very good at doing a double talk that made you believe that he could speak you know, Italian or German very quickly. And then I, I played him the Quechuan, and taking Larry's voice and flanging it a little, that is, it made it sound a little bit like it was coming through that snout on his face, we were able to produce what became Greedo the Bounty Hunter. There was never an attempt to create a definitive, complete language with all of the verb conjugations or the things that you'd really, you know, imagine. The goal in all of these uh, developments of sound is always to create the impression create the impression that there's a real language, that we don't understand it, but it sounds intelligent and it sounds like it has enough culture and background to it to be plausible. I never rigorously uh, insisted on one word having a particular meaning. Most of the spaceships, like the blockade runner at the beginning of the film, uh, it turned out that using World War II warbirds and slowing the sound down a lot gave a visceral pass-by quality which worked well. And sometimes I would add an explosion or a thunderclap or even an animal roar like a lion underneath the sound of the airplane pass by. There's a, a few different effects associated with Vader using the Force. We always put in a deep, low-frequency kind of earthquake rumble, which could be amped up as Vader tightened the Force on someone. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Enough of this. Vader, release him. As you wish. <laughs> The deep rumbles came from a number of different sources. Some of it was just uh, some thunder that was slowed way down and the high frequencies rolled off. Some of it was um, the slowed down sound of a missile launch. Um, and some of it was uh, from the Fox Library, actually. It was some earthquake material made for a journey to the center of the Earth. Vader was described in the script as having this life support suit on him and keeping him alive, as if he was badly damaged in some way. And so what I did in the early concepts of Vader, I had uh, some clicking, like there was some kind of relays and mechanism associated with him. I thought about, the, say, for instance, the uh, crocodile and Peter Pan, yeah. you know, the ticking clock, something like that. some signature that he always told you he was around. The script mentioned that he had some kind of breathing apparatus and so on. The early concepts of Vader I made up, he was beeping and clicking and breathing, and he sounded like an ER, the whole room at once, you know. It was too much. It was kind of distracting. And we ended up keeping just the breathing. Uh, and the breathing is me breathing through a particular scuba tank regulator. I went to a local scuba shop here in Northern California in San Rafael called the Bamboo Reef one evening and after they had a class where people left there were numerous tanks and regulators laying around the pool. I just went around and recorded different ones. I would breathe through it and I had a little tiny microphone, a little Sony ECM-50 and I actually put that down inside one of the regulators so it was extremely close to the valve that opens and closes and then I breathed through it and that ended up being the breathing that we used for Vader. It's slightly slowed down from the original recording. <laughs> As to the voice, George Lucas was auditioning different people to deliver the words. On the set, the voice was delivered by David Prowse, who was in the suit. Start tearing the ship apart piece by piece until you find those tapes. Find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive! I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic... You mission. are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. But he had a strong Welsh accent and it just wasn't what the character needed. So George eventually picked uh, James Earl Jones. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take it away! The trick was to record James Earl Jones, which we did in, in an ADR session. 
which means you're you know watching the movie and saying the lines along with the character. And then I combined the breathing and the voice together into one track. And then what I did was take that recording and play it over a speaker and go to different rooms, like a bathroom or a hallway or a lobby somewhere, and re-record the sound again so that the voice and the breathing were now affected by the acoustics of the same room and that brought them together. So they felt like it was done on the set as one unit of sound. And that, what we call worldizing, which means taking a sound and putting it out there in the real world, is a technique we've used frequently in all the Star Wars films, especially for exotic voices, because you don't want to build something in the studio that's clean and up close to the mic and just perfect. You want to make it seem like it was done on the set. Someone turns their head away from the mic, that you want that impression. And so we would go to pains later to simulate that kind of re-recording of voices. When Darth Vader crushes the neck of the rebel officer, the actual crushing of the officer's neck was produced by putting some walnut shells in a, a grapefruit rind and then crushing the whole thing. And so you got a smooshing and a crackling all at the same time. And it seemed to sound like his uh, neck was being broken. Where is the ambassador? Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive. <laughs> My first assignment was to develop the voice of Chewbacca. They wanted to have samples of what Chewbacca might sound like prior to shooting because it would be an aid in the actual directing of the film. And it would help the actor Peter Mayhew to actually perform the voice of Chewbacca if we knew what Chewie would sound like. Peter Mayhew, once he got really familiar with the sounds, uh, in, in fact, in some of the later Star Wars films, uh, would actually make the Chewbacca sounds himself. He got pretty good as, at imitating it. We never used his voice uh, for the actual track of the final movie, but he picked up on the, the, the technique and uh, the, the voice texture of it and um, did a, a good imitation. Ultimately, Chewie's voice was made up of mostly recordings of bears. And eventually I was led to a cute little pet bear named Pooh who lived on a farm in Tehachapi, California. And I would take the sounds and break them down into groupings that had different emotions that I associated with them. I took the angry sounds and put them in one collection. I took the cute sounds and put them in another. I took the sounds which sounded like an animal asking a question. At least the intonation was such that it sounded inquisitive. And once the sounds had been broken down into their individual parts, you could then edit them together and form little sequences of sound and in that manner build up some sense as, as to what Chewie was saying. And it was good because the sound a bear makes is kind of from the back of the throat. There's no articulation of the lips to form consonants. It went along well with Chewie's mask, which basically could only open and close the mouth. There wasn't really any lip articulation to speak of. And so the actual sounds from the bear seemed to work well with the, the mask of Chewbacca because you could believe that those types of sounds were coming from a mouth the way it operated on Chewie. <laughs> Screaming about it can't help you. I don't have it. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. But, sir, nobody worries about upsetting a droid. It's because a droid don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when they lose. Wookiees are known to do that. Anyway, we should be at all around about 0200 hours. Now, 
be careful now, too. All the voices in the hologram are my voice, treated different ways. I kind of got down to the end of the production and was running out of time when this material finally came in. And uh, out of desperation, I pretty much sat down and, and just made up the voices myself. Ran them through a filter so they sounded tiny and then put them together and you know, orchestrated them in the, in the little voices and the little fight that takes place on the chessboard. The jump to hyperspace was um, an explosive sound. Uh, there really were two sounds. The first thing was a generator start, which is a kind of a quick changing pitch of an engine. It was a, actually an electronic motor I recorded um, in an elevator shaft. It was the motor which starts an elevator up and down. And that was combined with a explosion, which was really just a piece of a thunderclap. The actual sharp beginning of the thunderclap was cut off, and, um, and then it was um, the more mid-range, explosive part of the clap was used for that moment that they actually break out into hyperspace. If you listen to the Death Star and you go to different locations in it, you're pretty much always hearing a low rumble, and quite often you hear a rhythmic pounding, kind of like a big heartbeat. And that, that was a deliberate attempt to kind of give the space station the sense of being alive and very powerful. A lot of the doors on the Death Star, the clattering of the doors opening or closing and the banging of the doors were recorded at Mount Palomar Observatory in California. I had gone up there and had the privilege of going inside the giant telescope room and recording the big motors that rotate the telescope and the, the big shutters which open and close on the dome. And uh, it was in a huge echoey space. And a lot of those recordings from Mount Palomar ended up being incidental mechanical sounds in the Death Star. A lot of the electronic backgrounds that are used throughout the film, the telemetry, the kind of radio sounds you hear low level, which make this place seem alive and kind of futuristic, came from recordings off an old shortwave radio that belonged to my grandfather, built in, in the 1930s. It seems as though it received sound that nobody else could get. And I used to dial around and be fascinated by all the electronic noise and signals that seem to be coming from space or somewhere in the atmosphere. And um, I had recorded some of the shortwave sounds as a teenager and saved the tapes. And when it came to developing a lot of the ambiences for Star Wars, I went back through those old shortwave radio recordings and pulled out little snippets of sound here and there, and, you know, ran it at different speeds and put it through echo chambers and had a lot of fun building the telemetry backgrounds, uh, which are part of the fabric of Star Wars. One of the joys of being a sound editor is when you can really create an off-screen world. And the Trash Master is a great example of this because when it starts up, 
everything that happens really is off screen. The sounds of the mechanism falling into place, the sound of the motor starting and accelerating as it begins to, you know, close in on our heroes. And of course, none of that really exists. There's no real mechanics there. there I guess there was, you know, the, the set could be collapsed. I, I was probably manually driven. I really don't know. But it can be very satisfying to, um, you know, take old motor sounds and dumpster door creaks and the sound of a pile driver, which was used for the acceleration, the pounding of the trash masher as it uh, got, you know, tighter and tighter on our, our group of heroes. In most film production, you don't have all the time you want. Sometimes the easiest thing to do, and your only choice is just do it yourself. So a lot of the voices that get thrown in, little incidental sounds like the mouse robot going down the hallway, it was really just myself doing funny little vocalizations and speeding the tape up and running it backwards and so on to produce little tiny robot voices. Once again, you have to be kind of inventive and low budget as you go along. A lot of the voices that you hear in the PA system in the Masasi Outpost hangar was um, just myself and two other friends I had, uh, John and Tom Silla. We got a bullhorn and went up to a local church when there was uh, no one around and it was a big uh, stone church so it had a lot of nice echo in it. And we just read lines through the bullhorn, things like, uh, prepare X-Wings for liftoff, and and so on, et cetera, and, and then took those lines of dialogue recorded in, in the very echoey space, and then later, you know, distributed them where needed in the mix to give the outpost and the hangar a sense of it being alive with uh, military activity. Gold Squadron, begin takeoff procedure. Minnesota Magnetic Field. Hold tight. Split your deflectors on double front. The end battle was fabricated from many different elements and they all had to orchestrate together in harmony. Principal among them was the voices, the radio voices of all the pilots and the controllers in the war room. And George Lucas wanted it to sound realistic. So we took all of the lines of dialogue and we actually transmitted them over a shortwave radio. And then at the receiving end of the shortwave, we had a tape recorder and we were able to receive the voices as they were transmitted and also then to mistune the receiver a bit so that you could have voices come and go as if the signal was being interrupted or wavering off the actual wavelength. And so when the final mix was being put together, the original voices are there, the radio transmission voices are there in different forms and a blend was made depending on whether the character was on screen or off screen. And this added to the depth of the whole scene. It made it seem like there was transmission distances between the ships and the war room, and that the ships, of course, were going through their aerobatics, and there'd be a moment where the signal would drop out and wander off frequency a bit. There's a lot of fire coming from the right side of that deflection tower. I'm on it. I'm going in. I suppose the idea must have come from war movies uh, and actual documentary sounds of helicopter fights, uh, things in Vietnam, things the public was hearing over the years, rather than having pristine studio recordings where everything was clean and absolutely intelligible. Adding this whole dimension of transmission to the voices made it seem more natural and real and gave it a whole new dimension. Red 7, standing by. Red 11, standing by. Heavy fire, boss. 23 degrees. I see it. Stay low. There's a heavy fire zone in there. Red 5, where are you? I copy, gold leader. Move into position. Say about 20 guns. Some on the surface, some on the towers. Rendezvous at Mark 6.1. This is Red 2, flying torch. Red 3, standing by. Keep half your group out of range for the next run. Copy, base one. Luke, take red two and three. Star Wars 
Star Wars being a, a Fox film um, allowed us to, uh, if we wanted to, to use some sound effects from their old classic library. And uh, being a real fan of the old sound effects, I did pull a few things and, and use them here and there. But most of the effort was put into customizing original sounds for the movie. there were uh, many new ships that needed sounds. The Y-wing fighters have a kind of howling sound as you are flying in the cockpit with them. And that howling is actually wind recorded atop a mountain. Actually, when I was up trying to record guy wires for lasers, the wind was blowing so hard through one set of guy wires that it actually was producing a musical note. It was almost a musical chord. And it was used principally for the background sounds of the pilots in the Y-wing fighters. What's wrong with them now? There are several creatures approaching from the southeast. Sand people, or worse. There's a line in the film that Luke uses. He says, sand people, or worse. And for some reason, somewhere along the way in post-production, the picture editing department began to say to any sound editor that showed up, oh, sound people, or worse. And at first it was a little bit of a mockery, but we began to take that uh, mockery serious and we had a t-shirt made up that said sound people or worse which had a picture of a Tuscan Raider on it and instead of holding his gaffy stick he had a fish pole with a microphone on the end of it and so it became a badge of honor to be a sound person. <laughs> <laughs> 